Hello, I'm Dan Mortensen. I'm the chair of this session and am the co-chair of both the sound reinforcement and historical tracks at this convention. And I'm also active in my local AES section, the Pacific Northwest. I've owned a live sound company in Seattle for 47 years now and have taken great pride in having mostly worked for artists and audiences who are listening very closely and that they kept hiring me to do that. The circumstances that have made this convention solely online have taken our work as live sound engineers mostly to a dead stop. Because our individual situations are unique to each of us, I couldn't think of anything for this track that would be relevant or useful about how to stay in business during these times and can only wish you all luck in getting through this. However, it seems likely that many of us will have to get back to work while the virus is still raging, and figuring out how to do that safely seemed like it would be useful information for everyone. So we've put together a panel who have activities around the world and have spent time examining documents and research from the health experts who are figuring out how to cope with this pandemic. We are looking at sources that have scientific bases for what they come up with, and the governmental documents that come from that science. As you must know, different parts of the world, or even with the same country, will likely have differing requirements or regulations governing our actions. Similarly, different manufacturers of the same kind of equipment have differing strategies for cleaning and sanitizing their individual gear. We've tried to summarize those strategies as well as the differences. It's critical for you to realize that your situation is unique to you and you will need to look at available information to determine what you need to do to cope with COVID, what materials and processes will be right for your situation, and who and what will determine if your efforts are enough. We've been looking at this rigorously as a group for over three months with 17 or 18 meetings during that time. And individually, people have been looking at it longer than that and I hope our efforts save you some time when you start looking for yourself. The whole point of our activities as sound people is to do the maximally effective action with adequate but not excessive resources in the least amount of time, and we've tried to guide our research to achieve that same result with our COVID response. It's critical for you to realize that all of us in this video make no representations about the appropriateness or accuracy of what we're going to share with you, and neither we nor the AES nor any other organization are responsible for any inaccuracies, omissions, or misinformation included here today, nor about its accuracy over time, since, as we all must know by now, anything pandemic-related is subject to change as new information is discovered or as the understanding of that information turns around in its own random way. So some or a lot of this will be wrong when it comes time for you to take action. A little bit of housekeeping. Handouts for this event are located somewhere that you've either already found in the AES system or a location that I'll announce in chat. And I believe we are present here today and running chat as we speak, so you can talk to us there. There will be a Q&A after the presentation where you can ask questions as well. This recorded video, minus the chat occurring today, will be repeated periodically during and after the convention according to the plans. Denise Woodward and Victor Arco have been looking closely at COVID coping longer than the rest of us. Denise will introduce herself first and then tell us how she figured out what to do about the threat of COVID in her work and will be followed by Victor. I should point out that Denise is one of the few of us who has been actually doing shows during this time, which has been immensely useful in putting coping plans into action, as she'll explain. And Victor is working like crazy on the sale of his company to Claire as we record so each of them will appear in videos, but not in the following discussion. Each of them has shed great light on the mysteries of how to understand the situation we are in and what to do, and we are grateful that they could be with us as much as they were. Denise?
Well, thank you so much, Dan, for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Denise Woodward. I'm a member of the IATSE Local 16 in San Francisco, California, uh, where I work mostly as an A2, an RF tech, and a comms tech in both theatrical and corporate settings. I also do a lot of work with the San Francisco Symphony where, along with being an A2 and an RF tech, I am the head audio engineer of the Symphony's experimental performance space, SF Soundbox. On top of that, I'm an assistant recording engineer for the San Francisco Symphony. I've worked on several Grammy Award nominated and Grammy Award winning recordings and I was awarded in 2012 the Grammy Award for the recording of the best orchestral performance, uh, a work by John Adams called Harmonilera and Short Ride in a Fast Machine. So like all of us, we watched the COVID-19 crisis decimate our industry and I really wanted to just try to remain positive and focus on what life would be like when we got back to work. And that's why I started uh, researching the cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting of audio equipment. Of course, all of us here know that the audio department in general, and the A2 in particular, is responsible for managing what I call high-touch multi-user equipment. The microphones, intercom, in-ears, two-way radios, even assisted listening devices. And you know, just realize that when we got back to work, expectations will have changed. They will have changed because of this collective experience that we've all had, the COVID-19 crisis. And it just seemed like the artists, our fellow technicians, our clients would expect that these pieces of equipment be cleaned more, more frequently than they'd been cleaned in the past. It might be plausible that a client would ask an A2 to demonstrate that a microphone was, uh, was sanitized before they were willing to touch it or have it placed on their body. Um, and even if there was no client expectation, uh, we can really provide a higher level of service and a demonstration of care for one another by having the knowledge of how to clean this equipment and by having the cleaning materials on hand. So I started by visiting governmental websites. I first went to the CDC, and the CDC website linked me to this EPA website, and this is just a screenshot here of the EPA website, where I found this list N, the disinfectants for use against SARS-CoV-2, or as we call it, COVID-19. When you drill in a little deeper, this is list N. List N is 25 items per page and 20 pages long of these chemicals that one can use on surfaces to eradicate the uh, COVID-19 virus. We have things like quaternary ammonium, dodecocidal benzosanulfous acid, and all sorts of crazy stuff that I have no idea what these chemicals are, but they sound really scary. I'm terrified to use them, and this is why I decided we really needed to get some manufacturer guidance on how to clean and sanitize the equipment because the manufacturers have a little more resources in terms of dealing with their own equipment. Going back to the CDC website, one of the things I noticed was that there was a very clear distinction between cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting surfaces. Most of us are going to use these terms interchangeably, but I wanted to point this out because when you read the governmental documents as well as the manufacturer's guidelines, uh, you'll notice that, that there is some pretty specific use of these terms. This slide is just a summary. I'll go a little deeper into it in just a moment. Throughout this presentation, we're going to do our best to try to flesh out a little bit more of what's presently known about, about this. One of the things you'll notice right now on this slide is that they use the word germ. Germ is a very generic term. We know that COVID-19 is a virus, and when the CDC put this on their website, I think they're trying to give more generalized information uh, to cover a multitude of possible pathogens. I will just quote from the CDC website, cleaning removes germs, dirt, and impurities from surfaces or objects. Cleaning works by using soap or detergent and water to physically remove germs from the surfaces. Uh, the process does not necessarily kill germs, but by removing them, it lowers their numbers and the risk of spreading infection. Continuing from the CDC website, disinfecting kills germs on surfaces or objects by using chemicals. 
The process does not necessarily clean dirty surfaces or remove germs, but by killing germs on a surface after cleaning, it can further lower the risk of spreading infection. Sanitizing lowers the number of germs on surfaces or objects to a safe level as judged by public health standards or requirements. So again, as you look at the manufacturer's guidelines, you'll see some specific use of these terms, so I wanted to point it out as both manufacturers and government organizations have some pretty specific uses of these terms. But the most important thing I found on the CDC website was this. The CDC uh, recommends 70% isopropyl alcohol for all electronics. If you look at the white box in the middle of the screen with the black text, that is just cut and paste from the CDC website. I saw this statement and I immediately had some very important questions. Uh, first and foremost, is 70% al alcohol safe for all electronics? Well, I know from even before COVID that you can't put 70% alcohol on all of our audio equipment. Um, it's too harsh for some of the cables. If you think about like a lavalier microphone, it's got multiple materials. It's got the connector, it's got the cable, it's got the microphone. Often it has a grill, it might have a foam windscreen. Can I really use 70% alcohol on all of those pieces of equipment? In the field, we often use uh, equipment from several different manufacturers as a unit. You might use a DPA microphone with a shore transmitter. Can I use 70% alcohol on all of those surfaces? And when I started looking into the manufacturer guidance, some of the manufacturers recommended 50% alcohol, some 91% alcohol. Are these effective? Can we use them on, against COVID? Um, secondly, the CDC says dry surface thoroughly. Will, will drying the surface interfere with the disinfection uh, contact requirements? Well, I don't know, but luckily Dan introduced me to Victor, and Victor is going to deep dive a little more into these questions. Victor? Thank you, Denise. My name is Victor Arco. I work at 8th Day Sound, where for a period I was a touring tech, and now I sit behind a desk, but it doesn't have any faders. As Denise mentioned, when the crisis started, we began investigating the safe disinfection of equipment. I'm going to share our findings and explain how they can be applied to your work environment. We also started with Denise's question, is isopropyl safe for all electronics? And found that the answer isn't actually straightforward. Let's look at why. When selecting a disinfecting agent, four factors need to be considered. These are known as the four C's. Chemistry. What are the chemicals in the agent? Concentration. What is the required strength of the solution? Contact time. How long is it applied for? And coverage. What percentage of the surface needs to be covered? Let's run through the four C's with isopropyl to answer Denise's question. For chemistry, we know it's isopropyl alcohol. For concentration, isopropyl alcohol is commonly found anywhere between 50 and 90 percent. But according to a recent study by the Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate, a 30-second contact time with 70 percent isopropyl resulted in a 99.9 .9 percent reduction of SARS-CoV-2 on surfaces. And last, coverage. This one is simple. If it doesn't get covered, it doesn't get cleaned. So always aim for 100% coverage on the material you're cleaning. But we also need to consider the negative side of the four C's. All chemicals are harsh, but we need to use them, so let's do it smartly. First, let's remember chemistry class. Chemicals react differently with other chemicals and surfaces. We don't want to damage the equipment. Isopropyl is not safe for all materials. It's always best to identify the surface you're cleaning and reference an engineering handbook to check surface compatibility. We also want to verify that the chemistry is not only safe for the equipment, but safe for the people. The best resources for this are known as a safety data sheet, and all commercial products are required to have one. These are readily available on the internet. It will have all information on proper safety equipment required and procedures for use, and a section on basic material compatibility. Stronger concentrations have a stronger reaction with the surface. 
always use the recommended concentration to avoid chemical damage to the surface or endangering the person cleaning the equipment. If you increase the concentration, you run the risk of damaging the equipment. But if you decrease the concentration, you may not effectively disinfect. For isopropyl, a 70% solution is actually more effective than a 90% solution. Isopropyl is hydrophilic and evaporates quickly. A 70% solution contains enough water to prevent evaporation while ensuring proper contact time and concentration. 90% isopropyl is very pure and evaporates too quickly and may not properly disinfect. For contact time, we need to ensure the surface stays wet for the entire recommended contact time. If your surface dries too quickly, you'll need to clean it again. Basic things like decreasing temperature and airflow can help, but if you can't hit the recommended contact time, I suggest you check your concentration, as it may be wrong, or you may need to alter your chemistry and try a different chemical agent. A common question is the relationship between contact time and concentration. Concentration and contact time are not linked in a linear fashion. Diluting 50% does not mean an increase of contact time of 50%. It's always best to consult empirical evidence from the manufacturer than to take a guess and run the risk of not properly disinfecting. To do this, it's always best to consult list and guidelines. And lastly, coverage. Again, always aim for 100% coverage. But remember that 100% of the equipment may not be the same material. So take care in applying the chemicals where they are needed. Because of these concerns, such as material compatibility and the ability to, to achieve the contact time, you may need to use a different disinfecting agent. And this brings me to my next point. Let's look into our disinfection toolbox. Chemistry is a tool, so let's use it as a tool. There are 500 different approved chemicals on list N, so choose appropriately for your desired results. Application method is also a tool. Prep pads are great for small batches and keeping in your pocket, but if you're working at scale, such as when the gear arrives back in a warehouse, you may want to invest in infrastructure such as electrostatic sprayers or UVC lights. These applicators do have an upfront cost, but they will pay themselves off in the efficiency gained. And these lead to what I have dubbed the fifth C, cost. In the time where work may be hard to come by, every cent can count. Some chemicals are many times cheaper than others and may work better. Spending some time investigating which tool to use could pay off. Now that we have knowledge of how to safely select disinfectants, we wanted to create some sort of a methodology for thinking about which items were the highest risk. Our methodology consists of three simple questions. First, how many people interact with this particular item? Is it only our crew, or our crew and the artist, or our crew, the artist, and maybe local labor? Number two, how many times people interact with this item? Is it touched once and forgotten during a show, or is it frequently used? And number three, what type of interaction is it? We know that respiratory droplets are more dangerous than contact by hands, so we add a weight to that. On the right is an example risk chart for a rental company. It's very important to note that this chart is unique to company types and the type of work they do. For instance, a recording studio with a console in a control room has a much lower risk than a console on a festival site where many engineers may be operating the same desk. Or for rental companies, rolling cases may have a large number of people touching them, but this risk does not exist on a static Broadway show. Once equipment risk is evaluated, we take another methodical approach to creating cleaning routines, and we ask ourselves six questions and document the answers to help create procedures. First, what type of equipment does this specifically apply to? Does it apply to all microphones or only sure microphones? What environment does this apply to? Is this for the warehouse or for use on show sites? What are special considerations to be noted, such as works for microphones, but not custom plated microphones? 
What is the cleaning procedure versus the disinfection procedure? How do you remove dirt and grime versus how do you disinfect a surface? What chemicals are safe to use and won't damage the equipment? This could be a list of a few chemicals. And what methods of application ensure the best results? I hope you found our framework for creating disinfection procedures useful. I'm going to give you back to Denise, who has collated a list of manufacturer recommendations. Denise? That was really great. So the next thing we'd like to present is a spreadsheet that we created. What we wanted to do was gather all of these, these manufacturer guidelines in one place and present them in a way that might be hopefully useful to you uh, on the job site. It's an Excel spreadsheet. It's several pages long. If you look down at the bottom, there are several tabs for different types of equipment. A tab for microphones, uh, intercoms, in-ears, mixing consoles, and Victor's uh, risk analysis. At the top of uh, the pages, you will find some guidelines for all electronics. This is kind of a common sense amalgamation of advice derived from many different manufacturers. Uh, simple stuff like disconnect the piece of equipment from power before you clean it. Don't spray liquid onto your electronic equipment. You know, spray it onto a cloth and then wipe it. Be gentle. Try not to get liquids into your ports or connectors. Uh, know that there's a difference between isopropyl wipes and, and disinfecting wipes. So next, at the top of each uh, spreadsheet are the column headers. And the column headers are common cleaning and disinfecting products, solutions, or methods. Um, they change with, with each category. For instance, this is for the, from the microphone page. Uh, we have 70% isopropyl solution in a spray bottle with a clean microfiber cloth. The individually wrapped 70% isopropyl prep pad. And when you look at the picture there, that's the one on the right, the medical prep pad. On the left is the 70% isopropyl alcohol wipe. They also have Clorox and Lysol and different alcohol wipes. The reason why some manufacturers recommend the alcohol prep pads is that they have a much lower liquid content than the wipes. And so they're often safer for our delicate electronics. We have the soap and water that we spoke about earlier. Demineralized water, some manufacturers recommend just demineralized water or distilled water is water that's been gone through some sort of purification process. So it's usually a little better for electronics than uh, tap water, heat, or uh, UV light. So that's across the top of each page, you're going to have the column headers. And then on the left-hand side of the page, this is the microphone page again, we've got sev several commonly found pieces of audio equipment. So we've, by the manufacturer, and we've tried to break down each microphone in this case, or each type of equipment into uh, smaller component parts that may require different types of cleaning. And then on the right-hand side, we have the links to the manufacturer's website, and we tried to actually direct those links directly to their page uh, where they talk about cleaning and sanitizing the gear. Farther to the right, we also have some notes. Uh, here's the intercom sheet. As you can see, we have uh, different intercom manufacturers on the left-hand side. Across the top, we have different cleaning methods or solutions, and then our links on the right uh, to the manufacturer websites. And you'll see a few notes on the far right uh, to help further our understanding of the cleaning and disinfecting process. So here's the IEM sheet. Here's the mixing console sheet. I also wanted to point out that you'll see several blank cells in this, uh, in this document. It doesn't mean don't clean it. What it means is that we didn't get a manufacturer recommendation one way or another. So we couldn't say yes or no, so we left it blank. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Denise and Victor. That was really wonderful. So when we come back, there's going to be some kind of sea change of processes and methods of how we're going to work when we return to work. And let's talk about the government and regulatory status of CDC, OSHA, lo local public health authorities in the USA. And for that, we'll go to Tim and Owen. 
Hi, I'm Tim McCullough. I'm a senior system engineer and general manager at Pro Audio Systems in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, for us, uh, regulatory compliance is largely a matter of following the, uh, the edicts of the, that currently exist and which may change every week. So for us, it's mostly staying on top of who our compliance officers are, additional contacts and advancing a show, and uh, working with other departments and other vendors in situations where there may not be, for example, a COVID compliance officer or other authority. It also impacts our training of staff, maintaining a more sophisticated library of material data sheets and things like that to ensure that our workers are safe as they apply these cleaning compounds to equipment. All right, thank you. And Owen, you're in a variety of jurisdictions. How are you gonna handle that? Uh, yes, I'm Owen Orzak. I'm an account executive at Eight Day Sound. We mainly deal with concert touring uh, internationally and uh, domestically in, in the U.S., but we have four offices overseas. So what Tim describes, our local offices are certainly going to be following procedures locally to London, Sydney, Los Angeles, and Cleveland. On the touring side, with the touring staff, we tend to shoot for the, whatever this, the most str stringent regulations are and follow those and work downward. So for like rigging practices, we follow what the procedures are for Germany, as an example. Uh, for electrical, we do what the Canadians do. Their, their regulations are the strictest. And once we do that, we find it covers us for all the other locations we tend to, to work in. So that is certainly what we are going to be doing. On the touring side, as far as staff, they're going to be working alongside production managers and stage managers and, you know, it's a, it's a hierarchy and they'll be taking guidance from them. A lot of, I'm certain a lot of the advanced work that uh, is going to be necessary in the future is, is going to be done and just dictated down to our crew chief and from there down to our crew, regardless of how it gets done, I'm, I'm certain that there's going to be an attitude of difference in the touring staff that are the people that are going to be traveling the most. They're going to want to be the safest and they want to see their colleagues and uh, tour mates remain safe as well. So it's ever changing already. So yeah, watch this space. Now we haven't tested it yet um, because we haven't done a show or haven't done a tour yet. Uh, when that does happen, and I hope it's very soon, I'm happy to start strict and work downward if it gets us all back to work. It can't come soon enough. Great, thank you. And Gordon, you're the closest one to the ground in the UK and Scotland of this group. What do you see difference? What differences do you see over there? Hi, I'm Gordon McGregor. I am part of a team that run a small production company here called GVR Scotland. And we are in Glasgow in the UK. Uh, the rules for this area have just been changed yet again. Uh, I have some links for them. The, they are changing as we speak because it has just changed in the last hour and a half. I will put the links up here just now and you can read them from there. They basically are very similar to what you have in America. We have the distancing rules of two meters or six feet away. Um, one of the probably most important ones here is that they recommend that if a job requires more than one person to do it, that the people get put into teams and those teams generally handle the same same job and the same components of the setup of the event uh, during the event and after the event, you know, loading vans or whatever else. Um, the other thing we've got just now here is that they are... Um, insisting that the health and safety license for the event includes a plan of how to deal with the COVID system. This will probably come under the remit of one person. Generally speaking, just now, the person in charge of that kind of thing in the UK tends to be the hall manager or the stage manager, as the traditional term would have it that person will probably end up having this put onto them and they're responsible for ensuring that everybody, both front and house, contractors or anybody, is totally responsible for what they're doing and make sure that their individual teams and uh, processes keep in line with the social distancing rules and the general hygiene rules that have been put in place. It is law in this country to obey these rules. Um, 
it is unlikely that anybody will deliberately break them, but it is also something that needs to be watched quite carefully. So in the UK and in Europe, we have this control of substances hazards to health. The link there, the uh, hsegov.co.uk link, will can give you a, a reasonable explanation of what these things are. Basically anything, any substance or that can be hazardous to health or can be a fire hazard or whatever, uh, has a score or a, a rating and that can come into the planning for how you transport the stuff and keep it in your stock at base or whatever. The ones we've been talking about just now has been isopropyl alcohol. Um, this is that link there will take you to a link for it. Um, IPA it's commonly known as over here. Uh, basically it's a flammable and continuous skin contact is harmful. It can also damage some types of plastics, particularly soft plastics. Um, the type of rubbery buttons you get on certain mixing desks can be quite adversely affected by the substance. Um, this is a sort of a net appraisal of that link. Uh, so basically it's quite inflammable. In fact, it's very inflammable. Um, you have to take precautionary measures against static discharges, so you got to be careful when you're using large amounts of it. Most of this stuff applies when you're using it in fairly large quantities, but we are going to be using it in much larger quantities than we have been in the past, so some care ought to be taken. The aerosol or the vapour can become an irritant over a period of time, so use it in a ventilated area. So that basically, if you're going to be cleaning equipment, don't be sitting away in the darkest corner of the warehouse. Try and stay somewhere where there's some ventilation. It is not a good idea to have it continuously on your skin and definitely a bad idea to have it anywhere near your eyes. Water generally will wash it off. It's better to wear gloves when you're using it and probably wear safety glasses if you're going to be using spray bottles uh, just to keep it out your eyes. Eye wash bottles should be kept nearby it. You should keep any container it's in tightly closed and in a cool and well ventilated space. Basically, if you keep the substance in the same way as you would keep spray cans or uh, oil-based paints, you're probably not going to go terribly far wrong. Um, bleach is a whole different world. I don't think these rules are significantly different from the US, except that IPA seems to be available in general shopping. Over there it's not here, you can buy it from suppliers like um, electronic supply shops. It's not generally available in shops here. The small wipes are, they're readily available in chemists. Those things are also surprisingly inflammable by the way, uh, which should be taken into consideration as well. It's probably wise to let those evaporate totally before you put them in the bin just in case they do cause a self-igniting uh, flame inside the bin. Otherwise, the conditions will be pretty similar, you know, advance it better, make sure you've got what you need to do, the, the standards that are being required of you. So it's not really that different, except that it's probably more already in set here. All right. Great. Thank you. So what changes will you see in our relations between your companies and labor, the venues, the artists, the promoters, and other clients. Tim, let's start with you and labor. Well, I'm an IETSC member, so I, I get to straddle both worlds there. Uh, I think that it's going to involve uh, perhaps retraining and resetting some expectations with local labor, or if your organization uses volunteers uh, or, or other people that aren't under your direct employ. For us, it's going to be uh, showing them how to do things in a safer way, how to avoid multiple contacts, how to avoid close proximity work, uh, because that also keeps my employees out of those situations as well. So it, it serves the interest of my shop, the safety of my workers, and the safety of the people I get to work with. On a slightly more macro level, it means that we're probably going to be coming in earlier on day of show or perhaps even doing pre-rigs on the day before where we'll come in, we'll get the lights and the sound up and get pre-rigged in for video and it's only someone from each department of my shop and then the local labor people so that we minimize the amount of overlapping contact. On day of show, we'll have far fewer people for, for production on the call 
And then at the end of the show, we'll probably be bringing them back in increments uh, and getting the artist, their people, and their stuff out of the building first. But it's still a big unknown because we're still waiting on that show to happen at this point. Uh, Owen? I have to uh, concur with that and that it does affect the venues along the same lines. I, one of the sea changes I would hope would happen in the venues is going to be the cleaning. We're going to certainly be going in and out of these venues and it would be nice to have a, the, the venue properly cleaned, you know, not even think about that. On the artist side, I mean, there's a few things I thought of right away. The first is, I don't know if any singer, artist, or whoever is going to want to not own their own microphone going forward. There's no reason now to not do that. Um, it's actually in your self-interest. The best thing I would ever hope for, and it's uh, you know hard to say, but I would certainly want the artist to provide some leadership and to demonstrate that they are they are taking things seriously and to to walk the walk you know to wear the masks to uh, insist that their crew uh follows suit you know a lot of crews follow the way that their artist is and if they're tight and they run a tight ship the crew follows right along so i would hope that would be one of my goals to see uh when we do come back great thanks and jonathan how about the promoters and clients I'm Jonathan Stovrid Myers with Carlson Audio Systems, located in Seattle, Washington, with offices in both Seattle and the Portland area. And we are a large regional sound company. Well, I think to build off of what both Owen and Tim have said, in organizing events with promoters and clients, we largely see ourselves as sort of a partnership in that we need clients to make money and promoters to make money so that we all make money. And in that partnership, oftentimes we find ourselves more than just a vendor, but also sort of educating clients as to what to expect in terms of working with labor and working with artists and working with you know, other vendors and how to bring the whole thing together. So I think that we will probably have a whole lot more conversations before the show about how to uh, dovetail all these interests together for both concern for the artists, as well as the labor, as well as other vendors to make it as streamlined as possible and help educate them so that everybody's on the same boat or, and everybody's playing by the same rules and everybody's taking the, the necessary precautions for COVID-19. So a lot of it will be education. The day will just go slower. You know, it's gonna take a little longer to load in. It's gonna take a little longer to load out. It's gonna take a little longer to sound check. And it's gonna take a little longer to get people through catering if there is catering you know, necessary meal breaks, necessary microphone cleanings, necessary, you know, time just to do a little bit more stuff as opposed to how it used to be done in the, the down and dirty rock and roll days. Yes, and if you look at any of the reopening guidance from anybody, they all seem to call for someone called a COVID compliance officer. Mm -hmm. And Denise found Andrew Bennett, who is a COVID compliance officer, and he's going to talk to us now about how you become that and what the COVID compliance officer does. COVID compliance officer position is a position that is based out of certifications arising from local health ordinances and public health agencies, labor organizations, producing entities, and California OSHA, and to some degree, federal OSHA. It is an emerging position the conditions under which this position exists are at best coming together slowly and change quite a bit based on supply chain and also based on government standard. Our position exists with a, the minimum certification requirements that a person have completed OSHA 10, uh, preferably for the entertainment industry, and also have taken the COVID compliance officer training. There's currently a very good one offered by Health Education Services Net, um, which is a two hour training. It's very comprehensive. It's based for film and television. So it specifically speaks to standards that have been agreed to by the LA County public health agencies and the producers and labor unions like IATSE, sag uh, and Teamsters. That training is reasonably priced. It's $50 at this point in time. 
uh, and is about as comprehensive as a training could be in two hours. And so I find that a background in safety is extremely helpful. Are you working for the venue or are you a union hand or what is your employment when you're on the job? Who is employing you? The answer could be yes to all three. <laughs> uh, and also there are COVID compliance officers on the employer side and the producing side. Really everyone that can take that class that I mentioned probably should. You know, department heads, technicians, regardless of whether you intend to be a COVID compliance officer. In San Francisco, as a member of IOTC Local 16, I work by appointment of the union. I can work for a venue as my direct employer. I can work for a producing entity as my direct employer. And I also have some fr freelance relationships and freelance capacity um, all underneath the Local 16 IOTC umbrella. Yes, I'm curious though if if there are any requirements for venues to have a COVID compliance officer and does that replace the unions? In my experience, venues have their own COVID compliance officer, but that does not displace the COVID compliance officer requirement for employers and any COVID compliance officer requirement that may be reached between labor organizations and their contract signatories. But what about sure. when you walk into a building to do an event? I, I don't know if, what venues you work in, but pick any of them that are pub publicly or privately owned. Are they having their own person there that you are working with as the union representative? So when, you, when I have been going into workplaces, there may be a COVID compliance officer for the venue, but there also might not be. Many of the event spaces that we use are shells when there's not a show in them. When there's not a show in them, they may right. have a custodian and that's it. Right. Um, and in those situations, the production companies are really the de facto controlling entity. And because this is in the sound reinforcement track at the convention, that reinforces the idea that those of us who are doing that kind of work need to advance the situation and see whose rules we're going to have to follow or if we have to ensure that the rules are followed ourselves. Each entity should have a COVID compliance plan in place prior to your arrival. Yeah. This is not something that should be made up on job site and there's no need for it to be a that uh, certainly would be a source of frustration if I ever encountered such <laughs> an event. I think additionally, there is for the audio department, uh, the audio department has a particular challenge that many other departments don't. In my experience in technical direction, I am used to the A2, the assistant audio engineer, being the person that places microphones on presenters and removes them when that presenter is done. By virtue thereof, that person is probably at the highest level of pyramid for possible exposure and also possible transmission to others. In that regard, that person, in my opinion, should be someone who has minimal contact with everyone on job site except those presenters. In reality, they should be in the green room they shouldn't be the person running out from backstage and clipping on mics anymore that stops by craft service maybe on their way back to the table and watching your wireless frequencies. That person needs to be dedicated to that specific task. And they should, in my opinion, should also be provided the highest level of PPE at, at present moment that's a medical grade N90 mask, which in September of this year are not commercially available. Th these, these conditions are the things that are changing our industry for the short term and probably for the foreseeable future. So Andrew, what, what challenges have you had with people providing their own masks and other PPE? One of the difficulties that we face is early in this pandemic, there was an interruption in the supply chain of available PPE. If this were a medical environment, there are existing rules to abate transmission of a virus. And those rules actually really inform the best practices that we're using now in the industry. 
those rules that were first formed in San Francisco um, in April were formed when the highest grade possible was cloth masks. And it's been an uphill fight to get people to wear cloth masks or surgical masks, soft surgical masks. And we've seen a lot of those masks that have the plastic valves that allow you to breathe, feel like you're breathing freer, even though your oxygen levels are no different from any of the masks that I've mentioned. That those pose a real act, a threat because they pose a false sense of security, in my opinion. And that false sense of security comes from the fact that they have a mask that protects them. However, that plastic valve emits perspiration and condensation and therefore is not effective in any way at protecting anyone else. And as we know, the, the people that spread COVID and a person who is infected with COVID that is spreading it is almost exclusively asymptomatic when they are at the highest level of uh, danger to themselves and their loved ones and other people. So uh, we have also concerns around people bringing cloth masks from home because you can't verify that they've been cleaned. For people who are in the highest risk and exposure to the most people, we have a limited number of individuals that are, uh, it's recommended to wear N90 masks with no valve of a hospital grade, they're kind of turquoise colored. And then for the general crew and for all department heads, because they're really in smaller pods of people, which is a key concept is reducing cross-contamination by keeping groups of people to predetermined levels where your COVID compliance plan addresses the fact that the audio department has little or no need to be within six feet of anyone in any other department at any other time, except for that A2. The masks that are being recommended at this point in time are the KN95 masks with no plastic valve. Thanks, Andrew. That was a terrific presentation. We appreciate your sharing that with us. At Carlson Audio, we've gone ahead and made some videos for in-house training purposes. We really want to emphasize and bring together the information that we've gathered on this committee. Videos you are watching have been edited to fit the format of this presentation and will be available on the handouts page following our time together. Feel free to use the videos in any way that may help you. We are happy to provide them as our contribution to the live audio and live entertainment communities. Truck loading begins with selecting equipment from inventory and placing it in loading order and using fork trucks or other equipment to avoid exertive exhalation and to limit the number of workers in close proximity. Changes from prior practices now include masks and distancing while working in the shop, limiting the amount of time employees spend in close proximity, and adjusting work schedules to have fewer employees in the shop at the same time. Other changes include rearranging offices and workstations and the creation of staff training in the safe handling of uncleaned items, enhanced hygienic practices such as hand washing or sanitizing before and after handling high-touched items, and the creation of training in manufacturer-advised materials and methods for the safe cleaning of our high-touch inventory. Before a mic leaves this warehouse, it will be sanitized and cleaned mics segregated from other inventory. This video does not address crusty spit, lipstick, or other unwanted dirt on the mic, which will need to be addressed separately, preferably before final disinfection. Here we are showing the disinfecting of the microphone surface. After disinfecting, mics will be sealed in bags with the date of service and the technician's ID on the bag. Now that we're ready to load the truck, remember our goal is to have only one person in the truck to move the cases from the tail to the nose of the truck. If loading from a level dock, two persons can roll flat-packed and pre-stacked equipment onto the truck, and the loader can move it. 
the dock workers can hand stack limited amounts of equipment. Unloading to ground level via lift gate utilizes one person in the truck to move equipment to the lift gate, a separate lift gate control operator, and two workers on the ground to stabilize the load on the lift gate and to move the equipment off the lift for other crew to place in the venue. And while we're talking about trucks, remember that the maximum number of employees in a truck cab should be two. And if you have two, roll down your windows, wear your masks, keep ventilation. Additional crew will probably require personal vehicles for transportation. At Load-In, we meet with principal leadership, stakeholders, and COVID compliance officers and verify that previously advanced details are correct. In our example, the audio crew chief is in charge of crew health and safety on the job site. Expectations with all parties must be clear and benchmarks established regarding the commencement or continuation of work. These criteria must be made clear beforehand. Our goal is partnership with all stakeholders for health and safety at the gig. Truck unloading to dock level is done with one person only in the truck to push equipment to the tail where it can be caught by the crew. Other crew does not enter the truck. In working with local crew, be mindful of proper COVID risk minimizing behavior, masks, hand sanitizing, and distancing, and that changes to previous ways of doing things will be in order. Also remember that providing clear directions for locating of equipment as it is unloaded can prevent unnecessary steps and unnecessary crew interactions. Early on, the audio triage table for the safe segregation of uncleaned, high-touched items and the cleaning, bagging, and labeling of them should be set up near the work area but away from high-traffic areas or in places where others are routinely working. Setting this up in Monitor World, for example, is probably not a good choice. Finding ways to reduce the number of workers required for a task helps meet our goals. Here, we have cut PA hanging to three persons two hands, and one of our hoist operators. Rather than stacking cases with exerted breathing, we will use easy tilt stands when the space is available, and that real estate may require some advancing. We prefer workers in teams, whether they are placing monitor speakers or running cables and snakes, and assign one worker to build microphone stands. Ideally, they will be the same workers on the strike and loadout to minimize cross-contamination. And consider how other gig-related things will happen. Work breaks. Could this be the end of our coffee and donuts as we know them? What about smoking areas or mandatory hygiene for local crew? For example, hand washing every hour. Also, catering and meals. All are going to be different going forward. It's going to take longer to mount a show and longer to take it down. Remember, our primary goals are to maximize distance, limit proximate contact, Minimizing exertive, huffing and puffing breathing. Flat packs and low packs in the truck will mean lighter trucks and additional trucking may be necessary. The use of lift trucks for items that cannot be stacked by two workers will be necessary. Workspaces should be marked out and reinforced that these are not hangout zones or gathering spots for others. They're places for folks to do their job, and people not working in those areas should not enter them. We've divided the standard sound system into two primary groups, high-touch items and everything else. High-touch items include all microphones, but especially vocal microphones, whether they are handheld, lavalier, or head-worn, and includes belt pack transmitters and receivers for wireless, in-ear monitors, crew intercom packs and headsets, and control surfaces of mixing consoles. At the show, a system needs to be established for segregating and processing unclean microphones and other high-touch items from their clean counterparts. We are using an audio triage table with separate marked areas for dirty items and another area for cleaned items to be packed and labeled. Handling clean items. Microphones are pulled from the workbox and placed on the appropriate stand by staff only wearing clean or new PPE. No one other than the artist or presenter that the microphone is designated for may use that microphone. If another artist or presenter is to take the stage, the microphone will be swapped out and multiple mics may need to be ready to prepare for this.
If a tech needs to test a line, the mic will be exchanged with a microphone assigned to the technician and restored after testing. Once a microphone is no longer in use or the event has concluded, the same tech that set out the mics will collect them and observe proper PPE use and sanitation practices. Microphones will be cleaned with a 70% isopropyl alcohol wipe. We are showing the disinfecting of the microphone's surface. The mics are allowed to dry and return to the bags they arrived in. Bags will be sealed, dated, and initialed by the technician. If, during the show, fresh mics are to be set out after collecting dirty mics, the technician will use clean gloves after sanitizing their hands. IEM and IFB receivers and wireless transmitter packs will be handled in similar product-specific fashion, and control surfaces not needing immediate cleaning will be cleaned in the shop. Unloading at the shop, equipment is directed to a technician designated to sequester uncleaned high-touch items for 72 hours. Then after donning appropriate PPE, will clean, bag, and seal items with date and initials. Items too large to bag will be recased with a tape seal across mating edges. Items cleaned at the show site will be audited and recleaned, bagged, and sealed. Deprep and preparation for the next show involves verifying that all high-touch items were properly cleaned before returning to inventory and cleaning again if status cannot be verified. Yeah, so a couple of things uh, we've been doing. I got this idea from the Shore Corporation, holding the microphone upside down while you're cleaning the grill. Another idea that we've been doing at the Symphony is using a dog clicker. Nobody speaks into a microphone. All of us have these dog clickers. Uh, they have a great impulse. They have a pretty wide frequency range. As was mentioned earlier, some sort of labeling system, some sort of system. This is the one we're using. We use these uh, Avery labels. You could do any kind of system you want, but it's dated. Any notes that you may have, the initials of the technician who cleaned it, and then, of course, a lot of uh, resealable plastic bags. We've been using these three by nine uh, plastic bags, and you place the microphone in the bag head first with the tail end sticking out. The presenter just grabs the tail of the microphone, and then they can be assured that they have a clean microphone that they are going to speak into. So, of course, there's a lot of different methodologies for cleaning miniature microphones and lavalier mics. DPA has got some great videos on how to clean theirs and really, really detailed instructions about cleaning the different parts of the microphones, which parts you can use isopropyl alcohol on, which parts you can't. So I would definitely suggest watching those videos if you are going to be using the DPA microphones. Also wanted to point out a point source has made these great infographics that make it just really easy to understand their methodology of cleaning microphones. One of the things we've been doing is individually wrapping the headset and then giving it to the user. And the user keeps their headset, whether it's a wireless or a wired device for the entire run of show. They open that bag and do the final mile of plugging it into their belt pack. Uh, and then they keep that headset with them the whole time. Same with the wireless. They have to keep the headset with them the whole time and they only return the belt pack to be rebatteried. And then we use the process of gently wiping the belt pack down once we've rebatteried it and giving it to them the next morning. One thing I wanted to note about this slide is the desiccate packet. Another idea that seems to work pretty well. We got these fairly cheap desiccant packets and we put them in, especially with gear that we have to clean on show site. And it just really is another defense against moisture. Try to mitigate moisture by putting the desiccant package in the plastic bag. And also, if you do have the opportunity on a long show to reuse some of your plastic bags, we've been cleaning the interior of the plastic bag and then putting the desiccant packet in there to dry it out before we redeploy that bag. One more quick thing I wanted to point out from the spreadsheet is ClearComs also made some videos. They're on YouTube. The link's there, and it's also in the sheet. They show their exact method of cleaning their devices, and those apply pretty much to all the different intercom devices that I've found, for the most part. Nice. Nice. All right. So now we come to the impact of all of this. 
it seems pretty clear that first more time is going to be needed at the gigs. And can you reduce the more time by increasing staff size and therefore costs? I think what's where my mind goes with all of this, and it kind of has been since day one, is that we just need to all be somewhat pliable to what each different situation is going to call for. And, you know, I keep coming at this from my perspective and from what my history is. And then I listen to Denise talk and share her experiences. And it's like, oh yeah, that's, that's her reality. So to answer your question, I think it's going to come down to some uh, event specific uh, evaluation on what you need for that particular gig or that particular event, just like corporate events aren't handled the same as rock and roll festivals and or private weddings. And, and the best we can do is be keep an eye open to all the departments so that we're all adhering to the best COVID practices while at the same time keeping an eye on, you know, our individual uh, departments so that we're protecting ourselves. It seems like pretty much every producer or presenter that I've ever worked with is going to be not happy to be spending a lot more money to hire more people to spend more time doing these events. How, how do the expenses get recovered? <laughs> I, th I think the largest expense is going to be a slowdown of the overall show process where we are built for speed. We are built with multi-pin connectors and looms already built up and it runs from the truck into the stage and it's up in record time and you see that with these huge you know 8 10 12 16 trailer shows that somehow roll into a city at 6 a.m and they're doing a show by or sound check by three and all that's gonna get slowed down and it's gonna get slowed down all across the board you know from my perspective the ppp supplies aren't prohibitively expensive and it's not prohibitively expensive to train people to be safe and communicate what those requirements are. What gets expensive is when a show becomes two hours longer or four hours longer than it traditionally would have, and you have 30 separate people on there billed at X number of dollars per hour, that's where they're gonna feel the impact. But that's kind of the cost of doing business in a COVID-19 world is, you know, you can only put 50% of capacity in the venue and it's going to take you four hours longer to do your gig. Does it pencil out to bring this artist in or to do this presentation or this production, knowing those are the costs of doing business and the cross you're going to have to bear. And that's an ahead, an ahead of time discussion, not at the gig. And it's, a, and it's a promoter, promoter or organizer uh, or producer discussion to have because they're the ones who have to make the money work. Uh, on on our end, uh, my shop is not the size of of Jonathan's. He's a, a bigger shop uh, by far. And but for us, uh, what it's going to turn down to it turn into is the work that has to be done back at the shop. In his shop, he may have to pay someone for another four hours to clean, sanitize, organize, certify equipment when it comes back, instead of just pushing it all back against the wall or into the next trailer to go to another show. In my shop, it means that someone's going to be spending an extra couple of hours probably working on things, and that person may well be me. Uh, even though I'm, I'm uh, not the sole employee, I'm salaried. I <laughs> will be the guy who most likely will wind up doing it uh, simply because somebody else has to get paid to do it. At a show, I'm definitely with Jonathan. I think it's going to ultimately, depending on, depending on your COVID coordinator or compliance person, uh, and the, the kind of interaction limits that they insist upon. It, it could be that we maybe just come in one hour earlier. It may be that we come in two hours earlier. It may be that we have a pre-rig day when we come in uh, because we don't want to have that much local crew. And as many of our crew and the crew from other departments exposed when the artist crew arrive. And the other moving part of this is that it's entirely possible that the artist or artist management will insist that promoters do these things. And they, they're not even an issue for us to, or a decision for us to make or negotiate. The artist will say, I don't want any local crew other than the, the four truck loaders and the, and the four backline people who have to get my gear up on the stage. I don't want anybody else in the building that doesn't have to be there. 
So uh, those are also additional costs. They're going to be borne by somebody, not us. Um, the costs of PPE are relatively small. Sometimes finding what you want when you need it is a bigger issue than paying for it. But uh, I think I think it comes down to is there's so much now that has to be advanced in ways we never thought of before. We've 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 not advanced a show thinking about well how how far apart do I have to keep lighting from from audio or from rigging? You know, uh, I've got guys waiting for points on an arena. I've got two downriggers down there tying stuff on while while the audio department's standing you know three feet away from them so they can get that chain hoist in the air and get the PA up. That's going to change. My people aren't going to be able to hang around with the riggers. The riggers are going to have to get their job done and move away. Then my people can come in. Uh, and getting things, getting tasks simplified, maybe what involves for us is making it easier to fly the PA out with two people instead of three plus a hoist operator. You know, I may take one person out of that crew, but now I have to put them on the other side of the stage so they can get that side of the PA up as well. So there's, there's, I think it's very hard to predict the, the specific financial impact as a generalization, and it's going to be a show-by-show -show comparison. Uh, and I think that a lot of promoters and uh, uh, planners are not going to be pleased when they see what some of it does. But I really think the big pushback is going to be coming from the artist side, because if those people get sick, whether it's, you know, David Grohl or whether it's, you know, the lighting director nobody actually sees, but they're all on the bus together. They all eat in catering together, or at least in some, some aspects. So when one of those people gets sick, if one of those people is diagnosed, if that bus has to be quarantined, the show's over. The tour is over because you can't replace all of those people on a tour instantly. So, you know, that's why I, I see the driving force behind those kind of things coming directly from the talent and not so much from production. All right. Anybody else? In amongst the guidelines that we've got and, you know, the government stuff, it pretty much covers, uh, you know, or makes a very clear statement that we are going to have to downsize events and also increase the length of time it takes to put them up and down. Uh, I can't find the actual paragraph. I've been scrabbling around looking for the actual paragraph there, but it, it does actually mention that. It doesn't mention where the money is going to come to cover it, but it does say... You know, you should expect events to be longer and set up, smaller crude, maybe a smaller actual event, you know, rather than putting on a big massive spectacular event, you should maybe consider making it smaller or less complicated. It's pretty much a direct quote from what I remember seeing somewhere. So in conclusion, before we get to the question and answer period, it seems pretty clear that coronavirus is going to be with us and we're going to expect some changes that are occurring to be transitory and others are gonna be long-term. And Tim, let's talk about the, our, the, the duty of care that we have as audio professionals. Well, we, we touch a lot of people, uh, both physically and, and in other ways. And our duty of care is to our, our clients, our performers, ourselves, our workers, our venues, because we can do it. We have things that control that we can exercise over the things that affect ourselves and other people. And we have a duty of care to exercise that control to the practical extent that we can, that we're not limited by some other force. So that's been kind of the point of our presentation here is to give people those tools and more importantly, to get them to think about how their practices can help carry forward uh, their, their profession and how they can work more effectively in our changing world. Great, thank you. And I wanna reinforce the points that we made about how we are not health professionals. We've done research. This is not the final word on anything. We hope that you'll use this to look into it for yourself. We've provided all the references. Somewhere in the program, there is a link to links and papers that you can download. And we've tried to put as much of everything as we have there. Uh, I wanna thank the panel. This has been a really great experience. Like I think I said earlier, we've been working on this for three months now. And the panel has been extraordinarily diligent and productive. And we found all kinds of things that I never thought we would find. And thank you all for your time. Every one of you has done a terrific job. There'll be a live Q and A in a minute here. I'm hoping that this talk will be available to be seen somewhere else. And you'll have to look because we don't know today. 
So thank you very much. And now to questions and answers.